I had the fortune after uh, my bachelor's degree and then several years of working with the U.S. Department of Agriculture to meet a fellow from um, Rhodesia, he was, it was Rhodesia at the time from Zimbabwe, and he shared new ideas, different ways of seeing things. This is Alan Savory. And um, basically he talked about looking at the earth and listening to what the land can teach you. And like the lands around here in Albuquerque where I'm at right at the moment um, are desertifying, they're dying. You go out on the grasslands here and there's, you'll find carcasses of dead grasses. You won't find new healthy baby grasses or teenage grasses or any adult grasses. They're dying. The reason they're dying is that there's not a whole ecosystem uh, function happening here. What's, what's changed is we've lost the migratory animals and the relationship of predators, the, the wolves and that sort of thing. That uh, relationship of the predator kept migratory animals like bison and antelope and uh, bighorn sheep and elk, kept them bunched and moving um, as a herd and uh, they didn't have the opportunity or the luxury to camp by riparian areas, by rivers and that sort of thing. And so they kept on the move. Well, now we don't have those animals. We do have livestock, cattle in places. They have the same abilities, you know, with their, the, the weight, their body size and their diets and those sorts of things are very similar. They have the ability to migrate across the lands and do the same kinds of things if you learn how to migrate the animals. And, um, and when you do that, it's remarkable what happens to the land. You can bring the land back, you can restore it, and you start bringing the health back. Now in the long term, you know, there's a lot of issues about livestock and cattle, um, I think, and climate change. Um, and a lot of that's because we really focus on the corn-fed side of livestock, and that, of course, is very dam damaging ecologically because, of, you know, to grow corn is um, pretty challenging uh, with carbon and all of the other pesticides and water and all that sort of thing. Um, but there's vast, vast areas on the earth. Two-thirds of the land area of the earth actually is grasslands and savannas, and those areas, you know, we don't, we don't grow crops on those areas. Those are grasslands. And, in some areas, like in Africa, we still have uh, migratory herds functioning like they did, and those lands are incredibly healthy. But for most of um, the world today, we've lost that ability. And what's really cool is that um, we can actually um, pull carbon out of the atmosphere, and we can actually do it rather rapidly. I was consulting early in my career with a ranch in Hawaii, and in one year, we doubled uh, grass production on the ranch. That means we are producing twice as much carbohydrates into the ground, which is carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere mixed with water, going into the soil, into the, you know, and build, building uh, organic matter in the soil. Num the number one uh, climate greenhouse gas is uh, water vapor. And when you've got more organic matter in the soil, you get more water in the soil. And um, so actually, um, water follows carbon. If you get carbon in the soil, you get water in the soil and you grow more more productivity. And so we have this incredible opportunity to uh, pull uh, carbon out of the atmosphere and rebuild it in our soils, and probably to the extent that we could actually reverse some of the issues that we're having today with climate change. You know, we're not gonna, it's gonna be really difficult for us to slow carbon going in the atmosphere uh, anytime soon. We all like to drive um, here in America, uh, China's coming on board, India's coming on board, and a whole host of other countries also want to have the kinds of equity like what we have. And uh, so I can't blame them. You know, and a lot of our, car our coal is now being shipped over to China and, and other countries and whatnot because we're saying we don't want to use that anymore, but, you know, it's still being used. It's like we haven't really changed anything. So, um, so that part of the equation is not going to change. And what's also really an interesting fact to think about is that our neighbors, Mars and Venus, are in chemical equilibrium. They, um, meaning that um, they're in a, in a state where uh, their atmosphere is carbon dioxide. And um, if you go up there and try to light a match in either one of those um, atmospheres, you can't because there's no oxygen. Well, here on Earth, we are not in chemical equilibrium, so we're out of, out of equilibrium, we're out of balance. Why is that? Because we've got a thing called photosynthesis. We've got green growing plants that uh, capture um, capture carbon dioxide and water and, and create carbohydrates, which is food, which is energy. It's, it's packaging energy from the sun, and it's an amazing ability, you know, because for humans to try to even replicate it, we're, you know, it's way beyond our, our capabilities right now to capture the amount of energy that, that plants can do. 
And so on the grasslands, we have that ability to rev that back up again, like the lands here around Albuquerque, they're just collapsing, you know, and you can go to national monuments that have been rested, no grazing for 75 years, and you can look across the fence where there is grazing, it'll blow your mind, which you see the difference in the amount of bare ground, the dead carcasses of grasses versus the green grasses on the other side, even though they may be overgrazed, which is a function of actually the migration. It's a function of time, not numbers of animals. And see, we've got that all wrong in our USDA and and uh, the academic world is we say take half and leave half. That's the idea that that's a it's a it's a numbers issue. But you know that's not natural. Uh, animals don't go out with tape measures and say, okay, here's half the plant. Okay, now move to the next one. They they eat the whole damn thing. That's the way their mouth is designed. They eat, eat the plant if it's a good, desirable, tasty plant, whether it's a buffalo or a cow, they eat the plant all the way really low. And the plant has figured that out over millennia and they've put their growing points down by the soil surface so that the cow can't get down to that point, the buffalo can't get down to that point. So as soon as, so theoretically the cow, the buffalo, the, the migratory animal is supposed to move on, but they don't nowadays because they stay where they're caught, um, trapped, you know, on the landscape uh, for you know, weeks or months, and if the plant gets bitten a second time, it's been grazed too too much. That's gets uh, got to be bitten, and then the plant, the animal's got to move on and let the plant come back. And I've thought a lot about why don't ranchers do that more. And one of the things is that I see that um, uh, moving animals is a challenge in the way we currently do that. To saddle up horses, you know, go out and beat yourself up in big country and um, all summer long. Um, you know, you know, and try to get maybe 80% of your cows, you got to go back up and get more and it's hot, dusty, dirty, it's a lot of work, hard work. And so I can understand why there's the challenge of moving animals. Um, when I was working in Hawaii years ago, one of the things that I did is I trained the herds that I was working with to move to a whistle. And so I had actually like, you know, 1,000 or 1,600 animals that I could blow a whistle and in 15 minutes I'd move them from one pasture to the next. I moved them about every day and a half to keep that, you know, to keep the health of that grass and we brought the grasses back and doubled production that, you know, in that time when I was there, it was amazing. And even in real rugged country like where I live here now in New Mexico, um, you can do the same thing. I was working a place similar to this as in Texas and had 2,000 acre pasture, 150 longhorn cattle and trained them to move to whistle. It took me 30 minutes to move all of them out of that that 2,000 acres. So, that you know, I think that's part of the challenge is that the the ability to do climate change takes a change in a lot of paradigms, not just one paradigm, but multiple paradigms. I've talked about several of the paradigms today, and it requires a lot of shift in our thinking and complexity of paradigm shift. So you've got to be, you know, you got to move animals. We're good. Okay. Well, we can do that. You, um, but how do you move animals so often? Well, there's ways to do that, and that's about training. And uh, ranchers typically here in the mainland United States feed cattle all winter, so you got an incredible opportunity to get them associated with whistle and getting feed. And then once you move them on to pastures, then you know for the summer months and stuff, you can get them moving. So the other thing is we've got this paradigm that cattle are bad for the land and uh, and bad for the climate, but they're the only thing that could actually save our earth right at the moment, you know, in terms of climate change.